Hello and welcome to another Waytag podcast. I'm your host, Corey Jennerjohn. And today I'm joined by Mi Zhong. Mi Zhong is a Waytag board member, and I'm really happy to have her join us today. Mi, thanks a lot for joining us. And first of all, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. So right now I'm in my second master. So I'm a student at Indiana University Bloomington, and I'm studying my Master of Education in Instructional System Technology. And I also had my Master of Social Work from UW-Milwaukee. I was a in the Navy for four years, so I'm a veteran. I was an aviation ordinance man. Ever since then, I've just been going to school. Um, currently, right now, I'm not wor- really working full-time. I'm just kind of doing a side job for one of the local meal service, Fresh Up Meal Prep. It is um, something that I discovered during the pandemic as a graduate student. So I've been a customer for two years and loved it so much. So I just ended up working there part-time while I'm going to school full-time. Awesome. So, so me, how, what is your, what is the genesis of your interest in uh, gifted education, would you say? Um, I would say I started um, because I was gifted too. And for me to be Hmong and be on the board, um, going back into some of the experiences of just being gifted and growing up in Hmong household, for me, it's also addressing the cultural differences that comes with a lot of you know different minority groups. Um, and I also feel that with just Asian groups in general, there's just a lack of research and awareness for what gifted is. And the fact that just in the Hmong community, we don't even have the word to describe it. And so growing up, I was just always referred to as just being very smart or being a very good student. Um, so I never got to really understand what giftedness is. I just knew I went to this one class in fourth grade um, and then that was it. And then good thing I've kept in contact with one of my teacher at the time, who is the gifted, talented program teacher, um, Jackie Drummer, who is also on the way tag board. Yeah. Um, and she she then really started to uh, just answer some of my questions as I grew older and I started to understand what giftedness is because last year I had like a mental breakdown kind of, um, I thought I had ADHD and I've been suspecting it for probably the past two to three years, ever since I started graduate school and I started looking into it and it become, it became to the point where it started really interfering with my daily tasks. And so I wanted to get evaluated. And then that's when I connected again with Jackie and, um, we started, started talking about, giftedness and what that looked like and how that can be misdiagnosed as ADHD too, which is very common. And so I got interested in it mainly to also um, create awareness for gifted adults. I feel like we as adults just kind of don't have the same support anymore as children do. Um, And we're just kind of left to go out there on our own. And so um, I've been navigating the world in a very different way that I couldn't connect with my peers. And I didn't understand what that was. And I feel like that is also maybe most likely true in a lot of Asian communities where we don't talk about this kind of stuff and we're not aware about gifted education. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. First of all, Jackie is, like you mentioned, Jackie is such an incredible a wealth of information, not just for uh, giftedness, but she's such a just an incredible uh, advocate for education and an ambassador for the state of Wisconsin. And she not only that, but she's just an amazing person. Uh, so yeah, I'm really glad that you you've you know worked with her, touched base with her, and have a really good connection with her. Uh, secondly, um, you brought up the the Hmong culture differences that really stands out to me. How you said there is there's really no word for you know giftedness in the Hmong language or Hmong culture how so how how do they like how does that relate to you know so there's no like um you know it, you know in the Hmong culture there's no differences between um you know 
kids being challenged in the classroom at all? Everybody's on the same plane. I mean, how does that how does that work in the academic sense? I feel like uh, because Asian is also the minor uh, the model minority, and so we've been given this label, and also just a lot of the values that you tend to see in a lot of Asian communities, where we focus on. Um, success and financial wealth and stability and getting a good job and that starts with getting good grades and so this is a narrative that is just very common in just a lot of Asian households and so we've been brought up in this and to me this is my norm is to just go to school I do what I'm supposed to do Um, I get my good grades and I don't ask questions I don't um give my opinion and and I get my A's and B's and then, you know, um, become a doctor or a lawyer, engineer, you know, some sort of job in that field where it's known to just be respectful, be um, successful, make a lot of more money than the usual other jobs, like in the art field. So kind of just put your head down and get to it kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so it was just very challenging in the classroom because uh, when I transferred to Rawson Elementary, where Jackie was working at, um, it was predominantly white. And so I came from Milwaukee public school system and I was so used to just seeing a lot of Hmong, seeing a lot of diversity, um, seeing people who look like me and can talk my language. And all of a sudden I went to a predominantly white school and it was a very traumatic and uncomfortable transition to have to be in that position. And a lot of the things that were being taught in that settings didn't really include um, Asian or Hmong, like um, a lot of the things that we do that we celebrate and that a lot of the students then started coming to me and going, oh, you're Asian, so you're smart. Um, <laughs> you, you're good at math. You're good at reading and writing. But what they didn't know was that I've always been really good at reading and writing um, as a little kid, and that's, which is you know very common just with um, gifted children is that you, you see that they're typically ahead of their peers. Um, but then as an Asian, it wasn't looked in that kind of way. It was just looked at, oh, you're smart because you're Asian. Um, so I, I feel like because of that, I didn't get a lot of the support that I needed within the classroom and at home. That's interesting. Wow. Uh, and not only that, I, I, it just kind of makes me think of the flip side. So you mentioned, you know, Asians, people kind of take, you know, academic success, financial success for granted. What about all of the Asians that struggle you know, in the academic field or struggle in the classroom, um, you know, people like you mentioned, you know, people, oh, you're, you're good at math or you're good at this, you're good at writing, you're good at um, all those other subjects. What happens if, you know, there's a st- certain student that struggles in those areas, you know, then what? I mean, <laughs> is there any kind of support then? Like, I, you know, that that really fascinates me how how so much of the academic culture is almost like I said, taken for granted. It's really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like um, with with those group of agents who do struggle, who is not your typical, you know, high, you know, standing, high achieving Asian stereotype, um, I feel like they kind of also slip through the cracks where um, there's a lot of pressure for them to be in this, you know, label um, and to try to focus on grades and getting good grades when sometimes, you know, it's, it, it just may be that's one of their strengths. That's one of their weaknesses. They're not very interested uh, because when we grow up in this Asian household, especially among, um, and I have my other siblings, um, my, my parents, what they would do is you would get $5 based upon how many A's you got. And obviously I got so much more. Um, And then I feel like my brothers, they were neglected in a sense um, where, you know, it wasn't like they always had bad grades, but they were getting more B's and C's where I was getting a lot more A's. And then I had my two sisters too, where they were not very high achieving like me. And so 
my whole life then I've been put on this pedestal and and seeing all these good grades that I typically have and it's very common pattern um, I feel like I didn't get as much pressure about going to school um, being a good student and whatnot but I feel like when I did transition and was going to go to college and I chose not to that was where I faced a lot of conflict with my parents because and not just my parents a lot of other family and friends where they were like oh you're so smart why are you wasting all of that and why why aren't you going to college um you know what's the point of being so smart if you're not going to do anything after high school where then my siblings they then got the opposite where they didn't get so much focus no one was getting down on them if they didn't want to go to college right away um, a lot of that was on me but then during you know pre-k all the way up to um, k-12 they got a lot more of the pressure to keep up and at the time, you know, with my parents being refugees um, and a lot of Asians who have this history where their parents are first generation immigrants or refugees, um, they have to navigate this world of trying to figure out how to fit in in both culture, trying to figure out how to thrive in school and ask for help. And I feel like um, a lot of Asian students suffer silently and take on a lot of that pressure, um, a lot of that weight. And I also feel like, you know, me going through school, I feel like um, I a lot of Asians, we didn't get the same attention from teachers and other students just because there was always that label, like you're Asian, you're typically the good student. You're typically the uh, the student that doesn't have a lot of problem that I need to you know work with that I have to worry about. You're the Asian student, and so typically Asian students are smart and they get better grades. And I feel like um, that in itself um, caused a lot of the other Asians who were performing at a normal your B's and C's, um, um, like my brother and them. I feel like they didn't get a lot of positive support. I feel like they kind of just slipped through the crack um, and they didn't get enough attention as I did because, you know, being gifted there, I got the attention um, because I stood out in a certain way. And then I was, you know, admitted into the program. And I feel like that in itself gave me the support I needed to thrive. But I feel like because my my brothers are not gifted and they're just your average student, um, I feel like they didn't get that kind of attention from their students. And they just kind of, you know, went through went through school quietly and, and did what they're supposed to. Um, and then, but at home, there was a lot of problems because sometimes their grades weren't favorable. Sometimes they got a D, sometimes they got an F. Um, and then that was being used to measure with my grade. But for me, I didn't see it as, oh, I was doing better or I needed more support. To me, it's kind of whatever, because in my mind, I knew there was something different about me, which was I was gifted. To me, it wasn't about getting good grades. To me, it was more about being interested in whatever the subject was. To me, it was trying to fight the boredom. And so I also got um, bully and criticized and called a lot of names because I stood out in a particular way. And so I think that for both sides, I think there's cons and pros to it. Um, I definitely faced a lot more pressure when I started to graduate from high school. And then that's where I faced a lot of the criticism, um, the, negativ the negativities in that because I didn't follow the path of going to a university right after high school. And so then my my brothers and them, my sisters and them, they were kind of let off the hook. Um, I feel like they weren't focused as much because um, this was their norm. And, you know, 
they didn't always have good grades then they school wasn't the same for them as it was for me i was the the more educated one as they would say it um i was the smarter one and so there was that expectation for me and because i already had so much of that perfectionism in me growing up as a child and dealing with all of this it put so much weight on me that i was having these panic attacks um, I was having uh, a lot of conflict with just the culture differences and trying to understand who I was as a person and what I want to do with my life because I didn't want to become a doctor. I didn't want to become a lawyer. I didn't want to go to a university. I wanted to feel normal, um, if that makes any sense. Like I wanted to go. But you didn't even know, but me, but me, you didn't even know what normal was at that point. Is that exactly? Okay. Yeah, I didn't even know what that was. I I just kind of wanted to be like my my brothers and sisters. I kind of wanted to be like my friends, where they worked at fast food, they worked at a retail job. But I felt like when I try to do that, I was criticized for that. And, and it was like, why, why are you working at CVS or why are you working at such a low end paying job when you there is so much more to you? Um, so I was always faced with that criticism, no matter if it was families or friends or colleagues. Once they recognized that I was smart in a certain kind of way, um, then when I did anything that was a normal mistake, like if I forgot something, um, if I was just so overwhelmed that I couldn't complete something on time, that was automatically pointed out. Um, and I was shut down for it really fast. Whereas I can see that my colleagues um, are not being um, looked down in the same kind of way where they kind of go, oh, you know, we're so used to you making mistakes. So if you make another mistakes, it's whatever. But once me makes a mistake, then we're going to point her out and put her on the spot for that. And so I felt for a long time, like I couldn't make mistakes. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do those normal things. Like I always had to do something that they thought, fig they thought would fit into, you know, being smart, um, being the, the um, resourceful one, being the one who um, was able to navigate and be strong on her own. Um, I, I always felt like I had to be there all the time. Um, and it was exhausting. It was, it was a lot of anxiety. Um, it was to the point where I felt like it was just impossible. And yet I didn't know what I was fighting for anymore. I didn't know what um, I was trying to do with my life anymore. And when I had the freedom to break away from all of this and I joined the Navy, I thought, okay, maybe this time I can do whatever I want to do and I don't have to live up to all these standards and expectations and putting being put up so high in this pedestal that I couldn't um, breathe anymore. But then, you know, it was the same thing. I started to notice because it's worth ethics. It's just not worth ethics, but it's the same thing that you find in gifted children is we learn fast. Uh, we don't need a lot of repetition. We, um, we get very hyper-focused and interested in things that appeal to us. And so then we just automatically catch on faster and then uh, we absorb everything and and that is very favorable in the workplace and so then they started to notice that and so I became the one it, became, it was the same thing like I became the one who is the to go to person I became the one who couldn't make mistakes I became the one that worked closely with all the supervisors um, the you know who are a lot older than me and who's had years of experience um, that I don't even have um, and so I started to notice this pattern and so then when I started connecting with Jackie again and talking about common traits and characteristics of gifted children and how that that doesn't end just in your childhood that continues on into adulthood and I feel like all those times even though I was supported in the sense that I had good grades um, I wasn't supported in the the social and emotional aspect because my parents didn't care if I can connect with my peers um, a lot of Asians families too because we typically are told to 
not talk, to not ask questions. And it was seen as being polite, um, to be quiet and to yourself, not share your opinion. And so if I was getting the good grades, there is nothing else they thought that was wrong with me. Um, but obviously, I did not have the social skills because um, when I transferred over to Rawson, um, I was referred to the school counselor to start working with this. And I was pulled from classrooms um, throughout from Milwaukee Public School System to when, when I was in Rawson um, to work with teachers um, or individual teaching assistants or um mentors and tutors who were high schoolers when I was um, in um, third and fourth grade. Um, and so they started working with me individually to really try to get me to talk. <laughs> and that was the main thing <laughs> because I was not talking, but they noticed that, you know, on paper, I, I was amazing. I was you know, my drawing skills for a kid was amazing. My comprehension, the way I thought, the way I, I, I you know, see things, the way I read and writing, it was amazing on paper. But then they were like, this, this child is not talking at all. This child is not playing with her peers. She doesn't have any friends. She's always by herself. And that in itself is also a problem. But, you know, my parents didn't think that was they they weren't aware of this kind of uh, kind of stuff and I feel like it comes from that lack of awareness uh, where because they're not talked about you know social skills and emotional skills and also the needs of gifted um, children they don't know how to support me so thankfully my schools were able to do that and my schools were able to provide for me in a way but I also feel like I was saying I feel like I got that because I was gifted um, and I feel like my brothers and my sisters they kind of missed out on that support because they were just your normal average student um, so they didn't get a lot of that one-on-one -on -one interaction that um, personal touch from a teacher um, and I, I kind of feel like that too in itself, it's, is, you know, a problem. Um, and, and when you start labeling a certain group of people, certain things like the Asians being the model minority, um, we're also then putting all these children who needs help, who needs that one-on-one, -on -one, um, they're, they're the ones who uh, can also thrive from that and, and really need that. Um, so as my goal to be here, to be in Wake Tag and to be the first Hmong on the board, that is what I hope for is that we start talking about what giftedness is. We start creating awareness for this kind of stuff. We start, you know, destroying some of these stereotypes and the label of being a model minority. And we focus on the child and the needs of the child. Yeah. And that's where, and that's where we should start. Right. I mean, we need, the foundation needs to be at the child and how we can meet his or her needs first. It's not, it's not about uh, a test score. It's not about a metric. It's not about uh, any of those things. It's not about a number. It's not about a grade. It's, a, it's, a, it's all about how do we, um, how do we make, you know, this gifted person better? Uh, in the truest sense of the word, uh, in the complete sense of the word. And I think me, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, and, and you're an incredible example because you are seeing giftedness through, uh, you know, such a interesting cultural lens, um, you know, not being, you know, being almost, uh, shy and ashamed to, uh, ask a question or let someone know what's going on that, man, that really blows me away. And it, it makes me sad at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I give you a lot of courage for, um, you know, recognizing that and at the same time, taking it a step forward and um, wanting uh, to help the next generation. I think that's, I think that's amazing. And I really appreciate all the work that that you're doing and all the work that you will be doing in the future. So that's, that's awesome. Thank you. What would you say um, for uh, you know, to all the, you know, the upcoming uh, Asian uh, gifted kids, uh, any, would you have any words of advice for them? Uh, how, how would you, how would you approach them? Uh, if you could, you know, if you could say something to them, 
uh, uh, right now? Yeah. Um, you know, um, my generation, we, for the Hmong in particular, we were the first, you know, generation to be born in America. And so I felt like my generation uh, worked on breaking a lot of those um, intergenerational trauma and barriers and closing some of the gaps. Um, so we've done a lot of work. I, I feel like my generation was a lot of the trailblazers. Um, and so for the upcoming generation, um, I feel like don't don't lose your culture, don't lose the language. Um, be be a part of that just as much. I you know, a lot of share experiences with Asian Americans is that we feel like we're not Asian enough. And yet we also feel like we're not American enough. Um, advice that my high schooler teacher told me was, um, why do you have to be one or the other when you can take the best from both worlds and make it yours? That's a great so, point. Yeah. And I, I've always carried that with me. And the moment he said that, I was like, how come no one ever made this a choice for me? Um, I always felt like I had to fit in into one or the other, which was conflicting because at home, it was all about being Hmong. There was no being a gifted child. It was you're the eldest daughter. So you got to raise the younger siblings. You got to help around the household with the cooking and the cleaning and stuff like that. But at school, I was the gifted child. Um, and so I, I always felt that tug of war in for the next generation, I would say, you know, you don't have to do any of that if you don't want to. You are equally both. And whether you want to explore more in, you know, the culture that is in to your Asian group, um, ethnicity, then go ahead, get in touch with that. And don't worry about being criticized from the other side or just the same thing. If you want to explore more of what it is to be American, don't worry about getting criticized from other Asians because when you focus so much on that, you're going to constantly be in that position that I was at where it was filled with a lot of anxiety. It was filled with a lot of having to try to be perfect when you don't even know what that is. Um, where you don't even know where to fit in. Um, and you, so you're just kind of living and fighting for pretty much nothing. It's very aimless. Um, and so I think that when you define that and you allowed yourself to be both, um, I think that that will also kind of just change your mind on a lot of things. And, you know, for me, I did do a lot of the um, trailblazing stuff. I broke a lot of the um, norms within Asian culture, like uh, being referred to a school counselor in third grade, I think did wonders for me. I was the only one in my family who saw a counselor. Um, and then from there, I then you know, was exposed to it. And so for me, it was kind of like, oh, man, someone wants to listen to what I have to say. Someone, someone cares about how I'm doing and what I think. And, you know, for a gifted child who um, hasn't had any friends, who hasn't had anybody that she can talk to, um, who's had adults within her Hmong community shut her down, and all of a sudden you have this adult woman um, and she's smiling at you and she, I'm like oh my gosh like she's a white lady and she wants to listen to what I have to say um, and that changed everything for me um, and that that empowered me to seek the help when I needed like I saw several therapists throughout um, my time like in uh, high school I did in college I did uh, when I was in the Navy when I was a veteran um, and to me, I don't feel shame for it because it has been my norm because somebody opened that door for me and told me that it was OK. And I think that, you know, with all the pressure of just being Asian, of going to school and whatnot, uh, go, go go seek the help if you need it. Go to a therapist if you can't talk to anybody at home. Um, don't be afraid to 
do something different, you're going to be met with a lot of resistance because trust me, I've, I've been through that. Um, I was, you know, believe it or not, in, in the Hmong culture, I was the bad child. Um, and I was sent what, what away. That, what does that mean, me? What does that mean? It, it, it was just basically because I was rebellious, I would say is the word in their eyes, because I didn't listen to them. That was okay. their their main argument. I was disobedient. Um, I had my own opinions. I was uh, very outspoken. And, you know, because they didn't understand that gifted children in general are just very curious beings and they're going to ask a lot of questions. It's not, it wasn't just me being me. It was just the giftedness that comes uh, and the traits and the characteristics that we're looking at. And so, you know, if Jackie was to look at me, if all the gifted um, and talented um, program coordinators and teacher, they were to look at my case, they would be like, oh, yeah, that's normal of her. Like, <laughs> she's asking a lot of questions. That's that's normal. It's great. She's curious. It's great that she has all these interests and she's able to be so intuitive and imaginative. But in the monk culture, that's not great. Um that's that's seen as why why do you keep talking back to me? Um, I'm your parent. Like, why are you being so disobedient? Why are you being so disrespectful? And so me and my parents, we always got to argument because I would question them about cultural things. For example, um, in the Hmong culture, um, we have a dowry price for the bride. And so I would ask about that because you know, I, I was also born in America. I didn't grow up in just a Hmong culture and in Laos. I grew up in in America. And so I didn't understand some of these Hmong customs because my parents didn't always talk about them. And so when I would ask that kind of question, my, my mom and my dad, they would start yelling at me and arguing with me. And they would see as I was just, you know, being disobedient and I was asking too many questions. And so I was seen as the bad child um and in reality, I was you were just trying to really understand yeah yeah and and i was more outspoken than my siblings because i had that curious nature because i was always wanting to know so i was always asking these questions um and so in high school after high school i was sent away to go live with my uncle and aunt in michigan and this is this is very typical of like the earlier days with the first Hmong. um um if you got sent away to go live with a relative you're like oh man you were the bad child like i didn't do any drugs i didn't go out late i had no friends to even go hang out with really i came straight home and uh did what i was supposed to do but because of that in itself of just challenging them in a certain kind of way where they felt defensive where they felt like i was being disrespectful i was labeled as the bad child um so Funny enough, even though got A's, B's all my life, had everything good about me on paper, um, I was the child that was sent away uh, to go live with my relatives to be kind of see if they could intervene and help me out and stuff. And so they were really pushing for me to try to go to a college after because I didn't apply for any. I didn't want to go. Um, and so they were upset with that too. And so they were trying to get my parents to intervene with that, trying to kind of support and maybe kind of influence me to go to school um, after high school. So I, I think that's that in itself, it was an interesting uh, difference in just the uh, culture aspect of it. And it was very hard to navigate because, you know, I'm a child. I didn't have anybody who came before me. My parents were the, literally the first ones to be here. So I didn't have anyone to tell me that, hey, when you go to school and you ask questions and you participate, right, and you do teamwork stuff, that is actually very good. That's what we want to see. That's what teachers are encouraging their students to do is to be more interactive, mm -hmm. um, to also have those peer relations uh, and be able to give their opinions because then that also shows if they're actually understanding the material, if they need help to ask questions when they need help. And for me, when I went to uh, Rawson and then the teacher kept picking on me <laughs> because I was the, because I was a quiet student and it was so uncomfortable because um, they didn't understand that for me, it, it felt like I was betraying my own culture. Like that's what I saw as a child. I saw that I was betraying being Hmong because 
um, the teacher kept calling on me. And so I would have to provide an answer. Um, and so then, you know, being sent to this kind of school where it's predominantly white and they encourage all of this too. And they're like so kind too. like, and then I would try to go home and expect the same thing. And it just didn't work. Uh, so I met with a lot of resistance. And so I think for the, for the generation that's coming up, you know, just know that when you're going to do something different in general in life, um, you're going to be met with resistance with people who are uncomfortable about it. Um, and if you let that stop you, you're never going to get anywhere. You're never going to get where you want to be because had I let that stop me, I don't think I would ever, you know, sought out another therapist again. Um, had I let that be something that I carry as shameful, that would have stopped me in getting the help that I needed to support my uh, mental and social and emotional um, aspect of who I was. Um, and to ask for help I think that's such a big thing in general with just a lot of people, but I feel like it's so much more within the Asian culture um, because of the values that we have. Um, it's to ask for help and uh, don't feel shame for about it. Don't feel like you're not smart enough because you don't know everything or you don't have the answer. Um, don't feel like just because you're Asian that you must know all of this you must live to these certain expectations because it's not true uh, you know if you put yourself in that constant always trying to thrive so highly for no reason because that's what you've been told um, uh, growing up you're going to be stuck there for quite a while depending on how long you choose to be there and, it, and it's a lot of work it's exhausting like it was for me like I said I had panic attacks in high school and I had no idea that they were panic attacks and I just knew something was wrong um, so I went to go see the school psychologist um, and that's when I learned that you know I was having a panic attack um, and so if if you ever feel that something is going on with you like you know yourself best don't let what the uh, the old traditional um, parents or thinkers tell you because they don't under they're not I feel like sometimes they're very stubborn yeah. <laughs> and, you know I, and very I think that's so. true yeah I think that's true in just in general like you're the older generation so you think it must be done this kind of way uh, but then you know they don't understand that the world is changing so fast yep um, well and, and because well it's it's worked like this for so long why would we why yeah. would we want to change it yeah right exactly. and and I think that in particular in Asian cultures, we need to break a lot of that. Um, a lot of the things that are very simple, I would say um, that, that, you know, I, I guess if like you, if you like the white people with the white students would be like um, asking a question, how's that wrong? Um, for us, it's like asking a question. Oh my gosh, like I'm going to put my life on the line if I'm going to ask a question. You know, it's so it's so different the mentality, and, and so it's breaking breaking that and being able to say, if I need help, I'm going to ask a question. If I need help, I'm going to seek therapy. Um, and it's that giving yourself that freedom, giving yourself um, that power and to do that. And that's what I had to do um, as, as a child, actually. Um, I had to break so many barriers so that my younger sisters, when they came along, they were doing things that were normal, normal American children um, things like being able to play sports. Uh, being able to stay after school, being able to have a job at 15 years old, being able to get their driver's license um, early at 16, you know, all the normal things that you would never think about that um, may be a struggle for someone else or may be considered just very difficult for someone else. I never got to do any of that because my parents were like, that's pointless. You don't need to do that. Why Why do you need to go out and hang out at after school stuff? Because they didn't understand that that was also important to get into college. Like they want to see what kind of activities, what kind of clubs you're in, what kind of sports you're in. Um, my parents just saw it as you just need good grades to get into college. 
Um, and so I was kind of, and when I started learning about this and I started seeing all my high school classmates going, oh my gosh, I have to be in this sports and I have to balance it with this activity in this club so I can get into college. And then I'm just like, what? Like we need to do so much more than get good grades. Like, <laughs> like, and I haven't been doing that. And so when my younger you know, siblings came along, um, especially my sisters, because they were actually very um, involved and active. Uh, um, I was able to push for that. I was able to advocate for that. And um, I was able to drive at that time. So even though my parents weren't always supportive, I would volunteer them and take them to whatever it was that they needed. Like I drove them to work um, and I picked them up. Um, I had to convince my parents um, to even let them work um, and do these other activities and um, whatever they were interested in at the time as a high schooler. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it's not easy when you when you are the next one to come up and you have to try to break some of these gaps and some of these traditional ways and some of these um, intergenerational trauma, it's never going to be easy. Um, and just know that even though it's not easy, um, there is a lot of support out there. There's a lot of good people um, and, and don't be afraid to step outside of whatever Asian community you're part of, which I did. And I honestly was called um, a white people lover because wow. I would, yeah, I would, because I didn't have the support within the Hmong community because the Hmong community is still very new um, at this time. Um, and um, they didn't have things like mental health resources. You know, they didn't have things like um, financial advice um, organizations that will help with those those kind of things. They didn't have any nonprofit organizations. They didn't have um, anything that would advocate for me and be like, hey, your child is gifted. You should probably take your child to these camps or these activities or get her hooked up in this kind of way. I didn't have that. There was none of that at the time. Um, I didn't have a lot of things that's happening now where there's there's a lot of Hmong educators. There is a network now of Hmong um, educators. Um, there is a network of just different nonprofit organizations that is targeted for just Hmong. Like this year, recently, I just learned that in Wisconsin, there is an organization that helps Hmong entrepreneurs and small businesses businesses like I was so mind blown because I, I didn't have this at all um, and when I started my um, master of social work at Utah Milwaukee and I had to do a project about an organization within um, Milwaukee I found one for the Hmong people and I was so like mind blown and, and yet very impressed because we've come a long way but again like I said that's my generation um, they've been able to break all of those barriers they've been able to start going, hey, we do need the support, we do need the resources, and we need to provide that for the individuals of our community if they shall ever need it. Um, and that organization, too, also help with domestic violence, which is so big. Um, it's still such a hush-hush thing, especially in, in the Hmong culture. Um, and I'm, you know, I want to say in a lot of Asian communities, too, domestic violence is such a hush hush thing miscarriage is such a hush hush things and you know for the younger generation i feel like we we've done a lot of the hard work um, we we had to do a lot of the the fighting we had to take on all of the the shame um that was given um like i honestly i was kicked out before a couple of times <laughs> like i've been wow. kicked out wow. um uh, my parents has threatened me to disown me they did disown me for a little bit um and i you know i've been like i said i've been sent away and i had to suffer through all of that and was it worth it absolutely to be able to see what my my younger siblings were able to do now the freedom that they were able to have it was so worth it and you have to see it in that kind of sense if you're going to look at what's happening right now it can be very discouraging because change doesn't come overnight uh, like I said, I've been doing this since I was a kid, um, and I just started to see that change 
after I graduated high school, after I got sent away from uh, my house to Michigan. And even when I came back, it was really bad. And it only got better when I decided to run away from home. And even though I was, you know, I was an adult, I was 18 years old. Um, I ran away and I took a Greyhound, went all the way to Delaware. That was what then when my parents go, oh my gosh, there's a real problem right here. Um, it took me to do all of that to get to where I am now. Um, and I feel like, you know, for the younger generations too, like you have to understand that the, the changes we made in our generation are going to be very different from the changes that you're going to make. And uh, don't, don't compare it, just embrace it and run with it and um, do more with it because now they have so much more resources. They have so much more support. Um, there's so many organizations that, you know, not just Hmong, but in a lot of other Asian groups that has been established. Um, there's a lot more research now done. Um, you have all of that now. You have a lot of the tools that we didn't have. And so utilize that. Uh, you don't have to fight all by yourself anymore. Uh, you have social media. You can just put it out there and let the people come to you, you know, <laughs> whereas yeah. before it was like I had to like secretly go find a therapist. <laughs> wow. Like I didn't even know where to look for that. And so I started with my school because it was free and I knew that it was going to be confidential. I knew that my parents were not going to ask me anything because they were just going to see it as me going to classes. Um, and so they're not going to be like, oh, where you're going? Um, you're not going to your job. You're not going to school. So where are you going? And so then I didn't have to feel um, like I had a lie on the spot. I can just be like, I'm going to school. And they're like, okay. And then they leave me alone. Um, but nobody knew that I was also going to therapy at the time. Um, and that's why I'm also very passionate about just creating awareness for these kind of things, um, creating awareness for giftedness and some of the emotional, social and mental issues that come with that, um, especially in particular because of the high achieving, because of the way we are brought up and some of that narrative that is still being told. Um, it didn't die in my generation. It's still going on. Um, and causing a lot of them to have mental health issues to commit suicide because they can't take on the pressure anymore yeah. because no one has ever told them it's okay go see the counselor if you need to that's why they're there at school that's why they're there um it's free you don't have to pay for anything it's all confidential um, no one has ever told them that and i feel like because of that so many asian students carry that load alone um, and they have to navigate through that and try to figure out how to make it work. Um, and for me, thankfully, like I said, I had the resources because I was identified as gifted. And so I was exposed to these things as a kid. Like my first time I saw a school counselor, I was in third grade. Um, and from that moment on, I knew that if I was not going to get the support and help that I need in my community, I knew that I can go to the white people <laughs> and that's how I saw it. Um, and that's how I became to be known as the white people lover because every time I would say something um, that I was taught at school, which, you know, came from mostly white people, my parents would see it as, Oh, you're just advocating for the white people. You're just listening to the white people. Like you don't care about the Hmong people anymore, but they did, also didn't understand that it wasn't, it was it had nothing to do about being Hmong or white. It had everything to do about me and my needs and what I needed and what I didn't need. Um, and that I that I don't have to choose either or and that I am both. And for them to understand that, because for them, they, they were born, they grew up in Laos. Um, for me, that's not my case. And so we had to really try to 
um, understand that and close that gap. And, you know, I didn't blame my parents because I knew of their history. Um, and I'm sure they were also trying to figure out how to assimilate as much as I was trying to figure out how to assimilate into this, you know, new predominantly white school. It was, it was that same thing. And so we were struggling on our own. Um, and I, I, I want to see more Asians Um, come together and help each other out um, to talk about these shared experiences because you know I've you know connected with so many other Asians I have you know uh, different types of friends from all over it's just very diverse and so you know I've talked with my friends who are Korean who are Chinese who are mixed um, um, who are Thai and Japanese um, and we talk about this and when we come and we start talking we're like oh my gosh like you you also went through that and then we're like yes and so that's when i started to get this idea of doing a podcast my podcast uh, where we start talking about these kind of stuff where we start talking about these shared experiences and i think that that's one of the first steps that these younger generations can do if they feel like they can't do anything if they feel like they can't afford anything or whatever they don't have the tools they need um the first thing that i did was I just created awareness for it by just talking about it. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we also start to destroy the stereotypes, the shame, the guilt that comes with it, any of those negative feelings that's attached to it that has been so heavily valued and taught in our our culture and it's associated with our upbringing, we start destroying all of that. And we start empowering ourselves we start empowering each other um and part of you know just talking about things too is that you get it out of your system and you're no longer holding it in and that's what i did i mean i couldn't i didn't always talk to people because like i said i didn't always have friends um but as a kid what i would do was i started writing poems and i started journaling Um, And that to me was one way of getting it out of me and putting it into the world. And so that I no longer have to carry all of that with me. And so for any of them, if you're feeling like you have the whole world on your shoulder and it's a heavy burden, release it. Release it in whatever healthy way you can, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it is talking to somebody else, whether it's journaling or writing poems. Release that. Release all of those emotions um, and and be okay and tell yourself it's okay to have all those emotions. I feel like a lot of Asians, like, you know, there's a meme I saw where it was just kind of making fun about how um, Asian dads don't have any emotions, <laughs> Until like you get a bad grade. (laughs) And I feel like that's still very true. I feel like now because my generations are becoming parents, um, it's starting to kind of change that. Uh, But I there it's still there, it still exists. Um, And to, you know, have emotions to express that. um, I feel like that message we see a lot more in um, um, in a lot of the white um, community because you guys have so much more resources you guys have so much more understanding because you guys have the words for it and I think that's an, uh, one important thing too like you can say that's depression you can say that's anxiety we can't necessarily always do that um, and so we can't express it and we can't go this is serious this is a, this is actually a mental health issue this is not just I'm feeling sad right now. Um, And then having your parent or whoever just say, well, go do something that makes you happy, you know? (laughs) Um, And so I would say, like I said, if you can't get it within your community, go find the help somewhere else. Don't feel shame about it. Um, Don't feel like you have to stay in a place that is not going to help you grow. Um, it's not going to help you be wherever you want to be, um, because I promise you, just because you feel alone in that moment, um, which I did a lot of times, I always thought it was just me, just know that you are not alone. And that's why I say, you know, talking and connecting with other Asians is so important, because once you start to realize that it wasn't just you, 
so many of us were suffering silently. So many of us were going through this and trying to navigate this as a child all on our own without even understanding what it really was. Um, and trying to then also fit into whatever the Asian narrative is that was set up for us um, and trying to fight that and trying not to become that. Um, and then also trying to feel good about yourself and trying to address a lot of the depression or anxiety or any other mental health issues. Um, and I, I feel like for these younger generations, you guys have so much more opportunities and you guys now have us and we will understand. We will understand if you say you're feeling extremely sad and starting to look like depression. We will be able to tell you, go seek the help then. Um, I, I've seen this a lot in you know, the Asian Facebook groups I'm in, a lot of my Asian friends who are my peers, who are my generation. We are more willing to say, you don't have to listen to the OGs. Go go seek a therapist if you need to. Um, go go do whatever it is that you need to. If you don't like that job, even though it pays a lot, quit. Like you don't have to stay there. No one is saying you have to stay there anymore. Um, that is dying down because we we started to end that in our generation because we didn't have that. No one did that for us. We had to do it ourselves. And so now that you guys get that opportunity, take advantage of it. Take advantage of everything that we've, you know, blazed a trail for you, that everything that we have shut down, that everything that we have worked so hard to change, take advantage of that. Because I could promise you, I'm not going to criticize you. I'm not, I'm not going to criticize my sisters for wanting to play basketball. Um, I'm not going to criticize you if you want to go seek um, professional help or if you want to quit your job because I get it because I understand the pressure because I understand that mental health is a real thing. Um, so don't pay attention. You know, it's, it's so hard because a lot of Asian um, we're, we're collective. And so it is a lot of family involvement. And for me, I had to tell myself as a teenager to go, you know what? These are my parents, yes. These are my elders, yes. But this is not their life. Um, and if I want to do something, if I want to be happy, I have to do things that they're not going to approve. And I had to stand up against that. I had to face all the name calling. I had to face being disowned at one point. I had to face um, being looked down upon despite being so smart. I had to face that all on my own as a teenager. And I had to navigate that. And I had to pull myself out of, you know, very dark places sometimes and try to make it all on my own uh, without any support. And that is not something that these younger generations have to do anymore. You have to suffer alone. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to put yourself through that anymore. Um, and, and, and wish that a lot of them understand that, um, that, they, that they really, really understand that, that they really see it too and believe it. Um, and that it's okay um, to um, also start creating your own awareness for whatever it is that you want to create awareness too. Um, because when you start that, it starts a ripple effect. Like when I did it, it was so hard because I have no idea what I was talking about. I had no idea what um, these symptoms were. I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I just talked about how I felt in my experiences. And by the time I know it, people started coming to me and going, thank you for sharing that because I was also going through and I thought I was alone. Um, and so make yourself you know heard like make yourself um be the one out there who is making these changes and it it doesn't have to be for anybody because when i started it was just for me i didn't do it i like i didn't start creating awareness because i was trying to change the whole community because i knew that was impossible <laughs> to do that overnight i just started talking because i needed to get that out of my system I just needed to put it out there. And then, oddly enough, a whole bunch of other people were able to relate and started to engage in that. Um, so don't ever be afraid to start something. Don't ever let your own self talk you down. Um, that is what happened with me, too, because, you know, I've been fed 
so many things about me and so many ways of how I should act and behave, especially as an Asian woman, I had to break barriers of that too, as a woman, as an Asian woman, doing all of these radical things. It was so mind blown. Like the elders were so mind blown. They were criticizing me. They were waiting for me to be, to get pregnant when I travel. They were waiting for me. Every time I returned, they were asked, they asked me if I was pregnant. Um, <laughs> and, and it was like, I had to prove that. And so I had to um, go, no, I'm just traveling because I want to travel. And I was, uh, I started traveling when I was 19 years old um, on my own. And every time I come back, they were waiting for me to just be pregnant so they can just, you know, rub in my face, like we told you. And now you're, you know, you're, you're a woman who's not desirable anymore. You're a woman who's um, done some bad things. You shame your family and your community and your elders. I had to break barriers where I didn't get married at 14 years old. And now as a 35-year-old single woman with no kids, that is huge. And I had to go through so much to just be that. Um, and, and now with the younger generation, it's more accepting. Like, we get it. If you don't want to have kids, you don't need to because it is expensive. And times are not like what they were in Laos. Times are not like what they were in our parents' lifetime. And so we, I feel like our generation are also... Um, more open to things and more um, more about um, promoting certain messages that are positive and empowering, um, more about um, bringing us together and um, starting to um, find solutions to these problems. Because in my, my, my times, it was, a, it was about talking about these problems. And try to put it out there. And I feel like the younger generations now, because I'm starting to see this already within the Hmong community, now it's talking about how do we address these problems. And so I feel like for them, they're going to get to be a part of that, to find those solutions, to determine what that looks like, uh, whether it is organization or whether it is, uh, you know, starting a YouTube channel and, and destroying some of this, whatever it is, they, they are able to now change that narrative and find a solution. And then once they create the solution, whatever it is that they come up with, they get to pass that, the good stuff, to down to their gener their kids or whoever comes you know after them. And so by the time generations come, they won't even be able to relate to what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> you know, like I feel like right now it's still very fresh because my generation is still uh, in our thirties and forties. And so we've just started making these changes. We just started forming these organizations. A lot of the Hmong organizations that I've discovered recently hasn't been around for a long time because again the Hmong hasn't been around in the United States for a long time we haven't been here for not even 50 years yet and so everything with us is still very new we're in a lot of that baby stages um, and so especially for all the Hmong that's coming in after me you guys are going to get to be part of a momentum um, that is going to be so incredible it's going to change a lot of things on how the Hmong do things. It's going to start breaking down uh, some of those old traditional um, ways and customs and values and uh, thinking that no longer makes sense. You guys are going to start to change all of that because we're, we're, we're still fighting it because we grew up in part of it. And so for us, like for me, part of that thinking is still very much ingrained in me. Um, and But my nieces and them, they have no idea. They would not even have a clue what I'm talking about because my sister has made sure that they get to hear a certain narrative. And so my nieces and them, when they come around, they will have no idea what we're talking about in terms of the problems and the um, culture um, differences that we had to fight. They won't get to be a part of that anymore. They will get to be part of a generation where they get to enjoy some of that, um, whatever it is that you know, fruits that reproduce. They get to now enjoy that part. They get to be, like I said, normal kids. Like I love, I love seeing my nieces and them grow, nieces and nephew grow up because, to me, it's like wow, they get to be normal kids. 
they get to think about normal things. Um, like when one of my nieces is seven years old. When I was seven years old, I was raising my younger siblings. I was cooking and cleaning. Um, I was, you know, pretty much the second mother. They don't have to do that. Like they, like their greatest concern is, can I get my app, iPad? Like <laughs> that, that is the things that, you know, they're thinking about, which they should be thinking about as kids. Um, and, and that's what I love. And when I look at that, I go, I, I made a difference. I put in the work and it was all worth it. It sucked at the beginning. It sucked at the time. It was a very, very lonely path because let me tell you, when you you do something so radical like that, it's a lonely path. People are going to shun you out. People are going to say a lot of things about you. And I had to at one point go, I'm done with all of that. No more people pleasing, no more listening to all of that. I'm done with that. And I had to start telling myself, positive things, things that I wanted for myself. I had to, my, my one of my counselors, she actually made me do this where she was like, I want you to say one positive thing to yourself when you look yourself in the morning, um, in the mirror every morning. And I was like, like what positive, what positive stuff? She's like anything. She, she could be just like, you know, I like my hair today. And I'm like, okay. I, I was like, this is so weird. Like white people do such weird things. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I started doing that, I started noticing that the more positive things I tell myself, the more I was becoming positive in a lot of aspects. The more I was hopeful, the more all of that resentment and bitterness and everything that I had to go through that was just so troubling and hard as a child all of that started going away and I started going, oh my gosh, I really do have control of also what I think about myself. I didn't have to listen to what these elders and OGs and my parents have to say anymore. I don't have to be the female that gets married at 14 years old and have kids. And I didn't have to be all of that. And I can decide what I want to do. And I stuck to that. And that's another thing is like, you guys have to stick to it if you believe it and you believe that it is going to be something great, if you believe there is a need for it, there's a change that needs to be done or a way to improve things, you have to stick to it. Um, and you might not see it happen in your lifetime. You might be 60 years old and finally seeing it. Like I said, I've been in my thirties. I'm finally starting to see some of the things I've been fighting for really coming into play, um, really getting the, uh, like I said, all the organizations and support among networks and like among events and stuff like that. I'm so mind blown. I had to wait for so long for all of this to come into play. So if you feel like you're not making a difference today, um, get rid of that. Because if you continue to think like that, then you won't ever make a difference. But if you stick to it and you tell yourself that whatever it is you're doing, you believe in it, you see there's a need within the community and you work hard to change it, whether it's one person at a time, one thought, one word at a time, if you stick to it long enough and you start doing something because eventually you're going to get empowered by it. Eventually, you're going to start connecting with people who share the same vision. And then all of a sudden, you guys come together and you guys start to make the changes and you take it to the next level. And that, and sometimes that's how change starts. It's very small. It's, it's sometimes so irrelevant that people don't think it's important because they see it as you're being ridiculous and they see it as you're just trying to stir up trouble, which was what people said I was doing was I was stirring up trouble. Um, and I had to tell myself every single time that someone shut me down that I was not doing that. I was doing so much more and that I had to believe it. I had to be convicted of what I was doing, that it was going to be worth it. And for me, I was fortunate enough because I had younger siblings and that very much motivated me because I didn't want them to go through it because, you know, I have two sisters. I didn't want them to go through the same thing. I didn't want them to be, feel, you know, be shamed upon because they date outside of the race because I didn't have the opportunity. And now they do. They're, they're married um, to, you know, people who are outside of our race. And so now my nieces and nephews, they're all mixed. And 
Um, if I didn't stick to what I was doing, if I didn't fight for them too, um, they wouldn't be able to have those opportunities. And if they did, they would have had to um, go through some of those same things that I was facing. Yes, they've been met with some resistance, uh, but it was not nearly to the degree that I had to go through because we couldn't even date outside of the race. If you were date, if you dated outside of the race, you were most likely shunned and disowned by your family, and it was seen as very shameful. Um, that is not the case for them. Uh, they they face some of that, yes, <laughs> but then my parents came around. Like when by the time they started dating, my parents didn't even care anymore. Uh, like they let them date at 15 years old. If I try to date at 15 years old, oh my gosh, like I would be beaten and I would have the elders you know, sitting in a room criticizing me or they would try to marry me off because I saw this guy and I went out with him for too long now and it was inappropriate. And those were the things that I had to worry about as a woman uh, growing up in that time. And so I think that the younger generation, you guys are in such an exciting period right now in just Asian history in general, um, um, whether you're Hmong or not. Um, there is so much that a lot of the Hmong now who are my age or 40 and 50 years old, uh, we're advocating for, we're promoting. Um, and so you guys now get to see all of that. You guys get to have leaders uh, within your own community who looks like you, who talks a language, who is very much also just like you. Um, and so now you get to have those role models. You get to have those leaders. So utilize them, connect with them, um, especially if you're a student. Um, I did this on my own. Um, I started connecting with individuals, whoever it was that I was interested, a mentor, I started emailing them at the time or writing letters at the time um, and just be like, hey, can can you um, make time for me to get an informational interview or can I job shadow you? Um, and I didn't have anybody that was Hmong. Now we have Hmong people in government positions. We have Hmong people in, who are CEOs who own their own business. And it's like, so you guys get that. And so utilize it, connect with them, build your network young. Don't think that you have to wait until you're 30 years old to build a network. Cause I built mine when I was young and um, I developed that social skills. And so work on that. And if I'm a gifted child and I did not have any social skills and <laughs> were, you know, t teachers had to work with me to work on that. Um, and I did not say anything in the classroom. If I had that kind of issue and I can network, then you can too. It's just a matter of putting yourself out there and doing the work, put in the work. And I promise you, you're going to see it, see it at the end. And it's, it's, you're going to look back and you're going to be very grateful that, it, and you're going to thank yourself for doing that. Um, and so that would be another one is just to start utilizing the, um, the people who are in certain positions or who are leaders already in the community and get connected with them, especially if you want someone who is Hmong, who is Korean or whatever. Um, those people exist now more than ever, more than before. Um, and it, it will continue to grow. Um, and whether you become one of that, um, do it. And I think the last thing I would say is that just still remember where you came from and be a mentor for others too. Um, don't just take um, and not give back. Give back to your community. Give back to the next generation that's coming after you, who's going to, you know, want to job shadow you, who's going to want to interview you for questions. Give back um, and and take that as an opportunity to mentor them, to pass on some of that wisdom um, and preserve some of the culture component too. Um, and take that as an opportunity to, you know, help someone who may be the next big thing. Um, give them that support, give them that encouragement, because like I said, a lot of these Asian narratives are still very dominant in a lot of households and so you just don't know they might not have the you know support and so be that support for them um and that that is kind of where i'm at right now is um now that i'm in 
as you know, the first Hmong Wei Tech board member um, and being able to now have the knowledge that I have, have the network that I have, um, I'm wanting to now go on that next step and starting to give back in a way where I can now take all these information I learned about giftedness, take out all of my experiences, everything that I've done up until this point, all the connections that I have, take that and put it in a way where I can give back to the younger generation. Um, and so I started with my podcast for that. Um, I've started with some of the things of just, you know, being on the board has allowed me to have a um, opportunity to just connect with so much more than I can ever imagine. And that is one thing that you have to be willing to do for yourself is give yourself that opportunity. Don't close the door before you even open it um, because then you would never know what you missed out on. And if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't, if I just, yeah. And if I just, if I had stopped um, my, I stopped, stopped communicating with Jackie, uh, I would have never been here. Um, I would have never been able to figure out that oh my gosh, giftedness is something that continues on forever. <laughs> it's just, it wasn't that one time. If I if I just left that classroom in fourth grade and be done with it, be done with Jackie, um, that would have been it for me. I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be talking to you. I wouldn't have these opportunities and and uh, this, this uh, moment to also be able to make certain kind of changes in giftedness in Hmong and Asian populations. I wouldn't have this opportunity. I wouldn't even be passionate about it because I wouldn't even know that this whole time what I've been experiencing was giftedness. It wasn't because I just had really great, you know, work ethics, which I do, but it wasn't just that. It was so much more than that. Um, and and that is one thing I would say too is don't burn your bridges because you just never know who knows what and when you will need that person. And I think my relationship with Jackie is the perfect example. Like I I think I I think we were calculating it. <laughs> We've known each other for over 20 years. Um, and so um, if I had burned that bridge, I would have lost a connection. And like you said, Jackie is just so amazing. She's so um, passionate about what she does. And she's, she just has a wealth of knowledge and passion and like kindness in her, I would have missed out on that kind of person. And I would have missed out on seeing her and um, Dal, her husband, um, do all the traveling, which I love. I mean, I started traveling because of her, um, because of the stories that she told. And she was like, always sharing her uh, travel stories with us in uh, gifted education. And I still remember sitting in that classroom the first time she told the story, I was like, oh my gosh, like I can travel as a single woman. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that's possible, you know? And I was like, and, and, and I stuck to, stuck to her and I, clung on to her and I met her throughout you know different parts because you know she works for the whole school district and so I saw her again in high school and I actually interviewed her um and then now that I'm her cogly I still call her my teacher um <laughs> but you know I think that's that's a lot of things I feel a lot of Asians don't have um they they're so afraid of network um they're so afraid of stepping out and putting themselves out there because you know sometimes it's no fault to their own sometimes it's just because of how we grew up and the values that are you know dominant in a lot of asian cultures where you know you think of asian you go oh they're they're quiet because they're polite and they're reserved and they're they're the group of people who doesn't have a lot of trouble like you hardly see us in the news we're not stirring up trouble and and you know um they're successful and they're highly educated. And so if you know, you start looking at that and you're not willing to step out of that, you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff. And so give yourself that opportunity. If your parents, if your community has never given you that opportunity, at least give yourself that. I think um, you own it to yourself. And, it, you know, that in itself, I see it as a form of just self-love is giving yourself these opportunities and taking chances um and don't be don't be afraid of the rest just kind of deal with it as it comes um and once it passed let it go and move on to the next thing whatever it is you want to do next me i can't say how incredible it has been to have you as a guest 
on here. I mean, just sharing your story, uh, sharing how much you've been a, a pioneer um, for, you know, not just Hmong, but Asians, probably everybody of all different cultures, just to, you know, just be courageous, you know, step out from uh, societal norms, uh, take a chance and be willing to be willing to accept failures in order to uh, get where you need to be. Uh, I think that's ultimately the end goal and ultimately very important. Um, you, your podcast, which I've listened to is awesome. And it is, it has turned into a cultural, uh, support group. Uh, it is, it is outstanding. It's, uh, it's very well done. And, and it's something that, um, not just different cult, you know, not, you know, Asians and Hmong <clears throat> folks shouldn't just listen to your podcast. I think uh, white people and other uh, other cultures should listen to it as well, just to gain an understanding and appreciation uh, of that culture as well. Um, the the amount of courage uh, that that you speak of and that you've talked about is uh, is nothing short of incredible. And I give you so much credit for you know having the courage to do all the things that you've done. Uh, you know, it, it takes a really strong person to, uh, you know, get shunned by their family and have so many doors closed for them and still uh, be, you know, strong enough to forge ahead and say, this is what I want to accomplish. This is what I, these are the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I give you so much credit for that. And that is nothing short of incredible. So um, uh, that is huge huge kudos for all those things that that you have done and for the all the things that you continue to do um and uh obviously thank you for uh thank you for joining the way tag podcast this was this was an enlightening powerful and very important uh conversation that we had um so i i just want to say i just want to say thanks Thank you. I loved it. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for having this opportunity just to reach a wider audience. So yeah, this, this was really, this was really great. So uh, thanks a lot, me. And um, uh, I, I would love to have you, I'd love to have you on again. So, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye.